Welcome our virtual campus online. Uh, you're part of the family time here this morning as well. And I, I believe that obviously Ryan's heard from the Lord this week, Mike's heard from the Lord. And truthfully, I had a whole different message planned until the middle of the week where I'm driving along and all of a sudden the Lord says, do this. And, how, and what do you do when the Lord says do something? Do it's it. like, okay, God, we'll turn and we'll do what you want to do because that's much better than anything I can conceive or anything I would think of or anything I would want to do. Uh, this morning also, the Lord gave me a scripture and I want everybody to stand up for a moment because I'm going to read this scripture over you, but I want you to receive it because... There, there has been so much fear manifested this past week or two that it, it, you can feel it on people. You can, you know, I'll, I'll be walking by and I can feel the fear, anxiety, and worry on somebody. And, and it, they'll be behind me and I'm like, and you look and you can see it written on their faces. And how, how many of you know that what should be written on our faces is the glory of the Lord? Amen. And that where we go, His peace should go. Where we go, His freedom is manifest. Because where His Spirit is, there's liberty and freedom. And His Spirit is in us. So where we go, we bring freedom. We bring liberty. We are the solution. Not because of who we are, but because of who is in us. And Amen. because we're His child. Amen. Okay? So this morning I walked in and I kept hearing this scripture in my, in my spirit. So I'm going to read it over you. I'm going to read it in a couple of different versions. And I want you to agree with this. In other words, instead of passively agreeing, because we do that a lot, people will preach and it's like, oh yeah, that's good, that's good, that's good. We passively agree. It's different if you actively. It's like singing that worship song this morning, we say, oh, he's the way maker. We say it's, oh, it's well with my soul. And we may say that, but we're, we're not sometimes prophetically declaring, just like David did, that it is well with my yeah, soul. Right. At that time, his soul was not settled. His soul was in turmoil. But he was declaring that, yes, it is well with my soul. And that's what we need to be doing in our lives. We need to be declaring the truth. The facts we see around us, the things that are happening around us, they are the facts we see, but the truth is what God declares. His truth supersedes facts. Yeah. Otherwise, Peter wouldn't have walked on the water. Moses and all the Israelites wouldn't have went through the Red Sea. Jesus wouldn't have came off that cross and rose again and saved us. Okay, all those things are God's truth, which prevail over the facts we Amen. see in this world. Amen. So, oh, the scripture closed on me because my cell phone timed out. Here it is. So this is 1 John 4.18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced, fully experienced his perfect love. That's the part I want you to get today. His love is perfect. It's not about our love being perfect. It's not about what we do. It's not about what we've done. It's the fact that He loves us so perfectly. Receive that perfect love today. Receive the love of the Father, the love that embraces, the love that does not let go, the love that will not abandon you, the love that will not leave you wanting, the love that will not leave you unprovided for, the love that will not abandon you. His love is perfect. And you are the object of His love. I used to be involved with a, a church group that one of the main leaders always talked about the nameless, faceless generation and how we're called to be that. That's not true. Okay, I, I, don't, I don't like disagreeing with this man. I trust him in a lot of ways. He's a wonderful Bible teacher. But the truth is, we're not nameless. We're not faceless. Amen. You are the beloved <laughs> of the Amen. Lord. Your face is to radiate His love, reflect it. You, you 
radiate his fragrance. You radiate his love. When you know you are loved, his love shines forth from your face. That love, that fragrance of being received and perfectly loved, that's what draws those that are lost and hurting. That's what draws the attacks of the enemy. But his attacks cannot touch you because you are in the embrace. And that's what I saw the Father doing this morning. I see the Lord going about through this place. I saw angels at all the four corners. I saw a huge angel right here in the midst. And I see the Lord going around embracing His people this morning, loving on them. I see Him taking eyes that have seen things in negative ways and replacing those eyes with healthy, whole, healed eyes that see the truth. I am loved. Ears and hearts that can receive. I am loved. You are loved. Not because of who you are, but because He loves you. So this morning, you guys can all sit down. I'm sorry. I bless you. This morning, obviously, God changed what I was going to speak on. And last, last week, Mike gave us some real, or Pastor Mike gave us some nuggets to really chew on. And I hope that you did the homework that he kind of assigned to everybody. And I, I hope that you remember things. Um, but I'm believing whether you remember or not that seeds have been planted in your heart, that seeds were planted in the spirit, and that things like the will and the skills, in other words, those are things that the Lord puts in you. And I'm hoping that what the Lord has to say today would stir up your skills, your gifts, your callings that are in you. And I'm hoping that it will impassion your, your will to be engaged in doing what the Lord has called you to do. We as the body of Christ are, are called to be active even if we're just standing. We're called to be active even if we're just living life. Where we go, we do. Where we are, the Spirit of the Lord is. He is in us. He said, I'm going to make my home in you. The Trinity has made their home in us. Do you believe that? Can you imagine how, you know, it's like they moved in, you know? That's what it says in Revelation. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and I'll live with them. It's, you know, we think of it as, oh, he's going to come have a meal with us. No, he's moving in. He's moved in. He wants to be a part of your life. So often we think of salvation as his end game. We think that all of God's purposes when he came as a man, as he came as Jesus, his whole purpose was just to save us. But that's, that's not the end game. That wasn't the purpose. That was the means to his end. His end was to restore fellowship with you. His end was to be with you, to live life with you, to walk with you, to share of himself with you. And to have you willingly share of yourself with him. Amen. Okay? So we, we, we short circuit, I think, where and what he had planned. We, we see it in a small way when he had a much bigger purpose, I think. Um, so I was driving down the road. And uh, it's a, uh, been making a lot of trips back and forth because we've been living out of our house. And so I've been driving between uh, up by High Rock Lake in Lexington all the way down to Midland, which is right over past Harrisburg over here where we were living. And so I've had a lot of time to pray in tongues and a lot of time to listen to the Lord. And this wasn't one of them. I was just driving along the road and it was cloudy and it was foggy. And all of a sudden the Lord said, talk about the big picture. I'm like, the big picture? What do you mean? So it's weird when you have a kind of vision while you're driving at the same time. But I stayed on the road. I didn't go in the ditch. My wife says sometimes I sightsee drive as it is. So this one I, I sightsee in the spirit, but I didn't end up in the ditch. And I didn't scare anybody because it, thankfully it was early in the morning. Um, so I had this picture of a canvas. And we have some canvases here uh, that our prophetic artwork from last week, which if you haven't looked at them, I would encourage you to go look at them because they, they're all 
they're all touching in so many different ways and they'll minister to your spirit and and you if you can just ask the holy spirit what he's trying to say to you through those pictures each one of them because i think each one of them will minister to you um but anyway i saw a picture and i didn't see a picture like i'm looking at it at a museum i saw a picture like i had my face like right up against the picture okay and i was seeing the dots and the brush strokes and i don't know if any of you have ever looked at a picture that way because i never really did physically until the lord kind of showed me this but it don't look like much that's the truth it's just you know you're seeing the individual blobs of paint you're seeing the lines you're seeing the little dots you know and from that perspective you see brown and you see red and you see this and then the lord showed me and he pulled me back and and i started to see things come together and he pulled me back a little farther and i saw that this picture was the size of a wall and i could see that the picture was so intricate and so just so magnificent that there was so much in that picture that I couldn't, un even beholding all of it, I couldn't understand it. It was, there were so many things going on in this picture. And I felt the Lord say to me that each of you looks at the big picture, but you're so close to the picture that all you see is these little dots and you make such a big thing about them. You think they're so big. You think that that's such a terrible thing or that's such a, a trial or that's such a weight. But when you step back, if you can step back with me and try not to walk over the monitor, but if you'll step back with me, I'll show you the picture. I'll show you the beauty of the picture. I'll show you what I'm doing. So this morning, I'm hoping to share what he shared with you in such a way that you'll start to see the picture from his perspective, that you'll start to see as he sees in your own life and in the lives of those around you, in our community, in our church, and in our country to some degree. There's, we're, we're, we're so focused in on everything that's happening in our own life and also at this time. And he specifically told me that our focus is so tight time-wise that it affects how we see and how we understand that we're, we're, we're right up against the canvas and it seems so large, but in reality, it's such a small part of the fullness of what God is doing. So this is a, a word that I, I almost promised I would never use, but now I'm doing it because that's what the Lord does. So the word paradigm, I have a friend who loves to preach on changing your paradigm. And it, it's a great message what he shares and what he talks about. And he talks about the father's love and he talks about having that paradigm change. But for most of us, paradigm is kind of a $5 word that what's, what's it really mean? You know, what does paradigm mean? D does anybody here use paradigm in their daily language? Anybody? Okay, well, I'm, I'm waiting for the person to pop. Oh yeah, I use it every day, you know. But paradigm, the definition is your example, your pattern, or your model. So I looked up synonyms to try to get a little bit better understanding of paradigm. So words like your criteria, your sample, your prototype, your standard, your example, your ideal, your pattern, your yardstick, or your image. So then I asked God, what does it mean? Because it still wasn't what I felt like I, it needed to be. And he said, well, it's how you see and understand the world to be. And he was specific, he said, it's how you understand the world to be, how you see the world to be. Not that it really is, but how you see it to be or understand it to be. And he said, and that's, that is where the paradigm needs to change. That 
how you understand the world to be, how you see it to be, is what he's wanting to change. And I can see how he's tying things together this morning through Ryan and through Mike. Why is this so important to us? Why, why does our paradigm have to be his paradigm? Why does our understanding of how the world is, why is it so important that it be the Holy Spirit's understanding of how the world is? Because today, we're in spiritual warfare. We're in a battle all the time. We're fighting and we're, we're fighting a battle that we're not always aware of because the true battle is for our understanding and our thoughts. In other words, it's all about whether we're going to agree with the enemy or we're going to agree with God. That's, that's spiritual warfare. That's, that's what it all comes down to is just winning is us thinking like God thinks, believing like God thinks. All spiritual warfare is about the enemy trying to get us to agree with him and not agree with God. That's good. Okay. I'll give you an example. Adam and Eve in the garden. What did the enemy do? The enemy came to them as a snake and said, if you want to be like God, eat this apple. So what's the problem there? Well, they were already like God. Were they not made in the image of God? Amen. So what's he trying to do? He's trying to get them to not believe God and to think differently about themselves than God thinks about them. Yes. Yes. Okay, let's go. Let's look at another example. Say, say the promised land. You've got the 12 spies. 12 of them go into the promised land. And what do they think? Oh, no. 10 of them said, oh, no, right? Yeah. 10 of them go, oh, we're like grasshoppers. These people are like giants. But two. But how did they respond? What did they say? They said, God will give us the land. Because it's his promise. And he's the one who's going to do it. So what's your promise, land this morning? What is he promising? Do you have to make it happen or does he make it happen? Exactly. Right? So... Again, 10 of them were agreeing with the enemy. It's too big, too much, can't do it. Oh no, we, oh no we're grasshoppers. You know, do you want to be grasshopper? No. We're not grasshopper. We're a child of the living God, right? Amen. It is well with my soul, right? Perfect love casts out all fear. He will deliver me. He'll even take you out of a stinky house. Okay. So why was it such a big deal with them? If you want to, if you want to look at that, it's interesting because God had already taken them all out of Egypt where they were slaves. So he took them from Egypt into the wilderness. And they ended up spending time in the wilderness because they were afraid to go into the promised land. Right? So they chose to spend that extra time in the wilderness. They were willing to be his servants, but they didn't understand that he wanted them to be their, his children. They got hooked up. Their mindset came from a slave mentality of, oh me, oh my, who's going to provide for me? Where am I going to be? To the, okay, well, we'll serve God because he's doing stuff for us. Versus to a son or a daughter where I have a relationship with a God who loves me and is going to make a way for me. Think about that. That would be something to look at this week. Do I have a servant mentality? Do I have a slave mentality? Or do I realize I'm a son of God? I know Ryan has spent years trying to get us to understand we're his child. We will not be forsaken. His, lo his love will not change for us. He loves us. The last example I'll share on this real quick. If you look at how the enemy tipped at Jesus, to me it's just, it's almost funny because here Jesus is baptized 
And God says over him, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Everybody remembers that, right? Do you all know that verse? Yep. Okay. Then he goes out into the wilderness. And so then what does the enemy come and do? He says, if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, did God not just declare he was the son of God? But it's if. So the enemy is always questioning who we are, who God is, and how God feels about us. Okay? That's spiritual warfare. This morning, I was talking with Mike, and I felt like the Lord said include this. Spiritual warfare is, to me, the picture that God gave me this morning was a car on a road. And all the things that come up in our life are the potholes. And if you can, you steer around the pothole. But if you don't see it, and you hit it, then it's a question of, are you going to let it mess up your suspension? Are you going to let it mess up the alignment on your car? All of a sudden, are you going to always pull into the ditch because you hit this thing or that thing? Spiritual warfare is about agreeing with God, keeping yourself on the road, moving in His purposes, moving in the things He has for you, not letting your alignment get destroyed, not letting your suspension or your tires go flat because you hit a little pothole. Okay, it's a pothole. That's all it is. It's a small thing in the picture of your life that God is painting. He's got a masterpiece in His heart and His mind to paint for you, for this church, for your family. He's painting. Don't let the dots of the moment be the focus of your eternity. Open back, back up. Let Him show you the picture. Let Him speak about what He's doing in your life. I, f I feel like a paradigm or the way we think, we can think of it as a stronghold. Amen. You know, Martin Luther wrote the song, friend of ours, Steve Hill, just loved this song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It's the only song I ever really heard Steve sing a lot, but he loved that song. Well, our, th our thoughts, our understanding, our theology, how we picture the world, it can be a fortress, okay? And there's nothing wrong with right doctrine. There's nothing wrong with good theology. We, we want to be right. But to be fearful, what's a fortress can become a prison. Okay? If you always limit yourself to what you have experienced and do not allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to you the truth, what has been a fortress or a stronghold does become a prison. Because the Holy Spirit is always teaching us, always wanting us to grow. We should be knocking out the walls like Jabez and putting our tent pegs over here and over here and over there because His desire is to extend our understanding. His desire is to cause us to see more than what we have seen. We saw that little bit. If we'll spend time with Him, if we'll be intimate with Him, if we'll allow Him to speak in every area of our life, including those rooms that I can feel this right now, there are things that you have shut off. I don't know who it is, but there are people in here that have doors in their hearts that it's like, I'm not going there again. That hurt too much. This is the past. I'm done with it. It's buried. Things you bury just start to smell a little bit worse. That's right. You know, you... you He's got the keys. He can go in the room whether you want to go there or not. But he's waiting for you to open the door. He wants to come in and I can feel his heart. His heart says, I want to make this room clean. I want to spring clean it for you. I want to, I want to make your view of it different than it has been. I want you to see that experience in a different way. He's not belittling the experience. He's transforming it. Okay? He's going to transform the way you see those things that have held you back. And there's, there's places on the other side of that room He wants you to go. And there are places that will bring you peace. And there are places that will bring you joy. And there are places that will bring you into, into the things He has for you. It's like I can see like a treasure chest in this room that's on the other side. And he's like, look, to get there, you have to walk through this room. Okay? 
you have to go and deal with that to get to the other side. Hmm. Okay. So the Holy Spirit wants me to bring up one thing real quick. There's a cycle that you'll see in people's life called shame, fear, and control. And you can even see it in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. You know, they, were, they ate the apple, all of a sudden they knew they were naked, so they were ashamed of that. And so they go and they hide themselves from God, like God wouldn't know where they were. Okay, so then he calls out to them and, and he's like, why did you hide? Well, because we were afraid. Okay, and what did they try to do? They tried to control the situation because they tried to make their own clothes out of leaves, right? So how many areas of our own life do we, are, we're ashamed of something we've done, or we're ashamed of some way that we've failed, or some way we've fallen short of what we think we ought to be, and so we're afraid of being exposed for being whatever we did, which is not who we are, it's just something we did, but we try to control the situation, so we try to take the defensive or the hiding or shut that door or do anything else that we can to keep from being exposed. And then invariably we end up doing something else that causes us more shame, that causes us to be more afraid, that causes us to try to control more. Does that not sound stressful? Does that sound like what God has for you? Does God want you to go in a circle? Did God want the Israelites to go in a circle? Do you want to spend 40 years in a wilderness? So what's the best thing to do? Let God come in that room. Let God's love be the thing that sets you free because you no longer have to fear about punishment and you know His love is perfect and He loves you in spite of anything you've done in the past. His love covers everything. It's forgotten. It's the past. It's, it's dead. The person who did that has died. You are a new creation. You are His beloved. You are the son. You are the daughter of God. Does, does your love change for your children? No. Okay? And His love doesn't change for you. Amen. Hmm. Why it's so important that we have his same mindset. You look at the disciples. When when Jesus was here on earth, the disciples knew he was the Messiah. They said, he is the anointed one. He's come. He's come to set up his kingdom. Right? But what did they think? They thought their paradigm, their understanding of the world, the way they saw it, the way they believed it to be, is he's coming to tear down the Roman government and to take over, right? right? Physical, kingdom. Physical kingdom, right? Physical. Instead, he came with a different plan, a plan that involves his kingdom being in us and that where we go, his kingdom goes. And it's a spiritual kingdom. Amen. That's why it's so important that we understand his, his thoughts, his paradigm, If I was to say to you, I'm trying to explain an apple to Michael and Theresa and Nick and Ryan, and I tell Michael an apple is sort of round. So what's he know about it? I'm telling him, you know, this is how God is. Only I'm saying this is an apple and this is what it is. It's round. So I I get out something. And as far as Michael knows, this is an apple, right? That's all he knows is, well, it's kind of round. Well, God's this way. He saves us from sin, right? But then I tell Theresa, well, it's kind of round, but it's also kind of sweet. So she knows that it's round and sweet, right? So that's a little different, isn't it? And then I tell tell Nick that, yeah, it's round, it's sweet, and it's kind of smooth. You know, God loves you, and he has a plan for your life beyond just saving you. See? So all of a sudden, he, he knows that an apple is round, 
it's sweet and it's smooth, right? Does he have it? No. So now I say, oh, it's round, it's sweet, it's smooth, and also it's red. Okay, but does Ryan really know what an apple is yet? Now, if he tastes it, does he know what an apple's like? Absolutely. Okay, do you see how your paradigm changes? Do you, do you, do you see how a paradigm changes? It doesn't change because somebody tells you you are loved. It doesn't change because you say, oh, I'm loved. It doesn't change because I say I'm the Son of God. It changes when you experience it. Taste and see. There's so many areas of your life, so many things that He wants you to step back and see it and behold it with Him. He wants to share His creation with you. Everything that we see here, Adam and Eve were put in the garden to share His creation, fellowship with Him, and they were given His authority. And that's what we've been given. That's who we are. He wants to share His creation with us. He wants to participate in that sharing, be with us, fellowship with us. And He wants us to taste and see and know how good His love is. Amen. <laughs> so how do we taste and see? How do you taste and see? You taste and see by experiencing the world with the Holy Spirit, with the Trinity that's in us. The Holy Spirit is in you. Jesus said, and this blows my mind, can you imagine the Son of God says, this is what He said, Nevertheless, this is John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send Him. Amen. Is that, is that not amazing? The Son of God was here on earth and says to His disciples, it's better for you if I go away to heaven and the Holy Spirit comes. How many of us as Christians live our life like it's better? How many of us would think, oh, it's better if Jesus was here right here with me, walking through this. Now, He is. Let's, let's be honest. Spiritually, He is in you. But the reality is, how much do we connect, abide, rest, and move with the Holy Spirit? That's good. That's good. You know? It's better for us. Amen. Get up in the morning and say, it's better for me. The Holy Spirit is better for me. The fact that He's in me and living life with me is better for me. Does that not blow your mind? I mean, He said, I'll be called Emmanuel. God with you. God with you. Next time you're down, say, you're Emmanuel. You're God with me. I am not alone. I am not forsaken. I am not... I am not anything. Everything I need pertaining to life and godliness. Everything I need to live life. Everything I need to walk in the truth of what God has for me. His truth. More than the facts of everything around me. His truth. Everything that pertains to life and the truth. Godliness. Truth. To be like God. To live like God wants for me. He has given me. And He's given it to me in the Holy Spirit. He's given it to me and is making a way. His painting over me and for me and His destiny for me is beautiful. It's intricate. And I've been seeing it from here. But if I'll just be with Him, I'll see it from back here. The Holy Spirit, our comforter, helper, teacher, Emmanuel, God with us. It's amazing because Moses, when they were going to the Promised Land, he said... I'm not going unless you go with me. Amen. Okay? So in other words, we're not going to go into the promises you've given us as a whole nation unless you go with us. And now we have Him who goes with us everywhere we go. Amen. Him who is in us. 
Him who does not forsake us. Him who has a purpose and a plan for us individually, not for this nation, not that he doesn't, but he has a plan for Michael Howard. He has a plan for Esther. He has a plan for John Restucci. He has a plan for Jake and for Ethel and Christine. He has a plan for each and every one of us. And it's not a simple plan. No, no. no. no, no. no it's, it's beyond any earthly masterpiece. This picture is more intricate, more detailed, more skillful, more beautiful, more complete, more fulfilling than anything we can conceive of, anything we could think of, anything we could dream of. Our dreams are literally but a shiny shadow of what He's got planned for us. Can you imagine that? The best things you can think of fall far short of the things He has planned and desires for us. Amen. The joy He wants to give us, the peace He wants to pour out of us and on us and through us are beyond our understanding, beyond our comprehension, beyond our wildest dreams. He said, I will ask the Father. He will give you another helper to be with you forever. Forever with us. Forever. Even the Spirit of truth. Truth. His truth. The Spirit who reveals the truth of God which exceeds the facts of this world. Which exceeds and, and tears down our own vain imaginations, our own thoughts, our own comprehensions about our situation. I'm sick and it's unto death. Nah. That's not true because the Lord is our healer. And even if you were to die, just ask Lazarus what happened. Amen. Okay? The truths of the, or excuse me, the facts of this world do not chain God in any way. Amen. He who spoke and the world was created is not bound by the world he created. That's right. Okay? The situations you've created in your life do not bind him. He's not scared. He's not scared of your mortgage payment. He's not scared of your joblessness. He's not scared of difficulties in your marriage. He's not scared of health concerns. He's not scared of your unforgiveness or your bitterness. He's not scared of your anger at Him. He said to Job, come, tell me about it. Okay? He's not scared of your sin. And He's not scared of your shame. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. He will show you. He will teach you. You know, I went to a Bible school, and like a lot of young men and young women, or old men and old women, I was hoping to have like a personal mentor, you know, kind of when I got there. I wanted some man of God or woman of God that tell me how it was and how I should do it and have some one-on-one -on -one time with them and, you know, just, you know, be mentored by a spiritual giant, you know, somebody who walking on water type of thing and raising the dead and healing the sick. Well, when you got 600 people in your class, you know, and there's, what, 10 people on staff, how likely is that, honestly, you know? So, you know, I'm there two weeks and I'm like, God, this ain't like I thought it would be. I thought I'd have more, you know, personal mentorship, you know, input from people. And he said, well, would you rather have it from them or would you rather have it from me? Amen. Yeah. He said, I, I'll be your mentor. I'll teach you. I'll live life with you. I'll, I'll share with you. I'll share my heart and I'll share the things you should do and not do. And I said, that works. Okay. Because what else do you say? Yeah. You know? He's like, uh, well, no, God, it'd still be nice if, you know, David Ravenhill would talk to me or, you know, Steve Hill would talk to me or John Kilpatrick would call up and say, hey, Doug, let's go get a cup of coffee. You know, no, you don't do that. And, and I'm saying this jokingly, but he's made the same invitation that that, hey, he's knocking at your door. He's knocking at your door every day. Amen. OK, he's there. He's he's shadowing you. He's with you everywhere you go. The good, the bad, and the indifferent. The question is, is, do you want to talk with him and talk about it? Do you, want to, do you want to unload the things that burden you the most? Or do you want to keep it 
when you have friends, you, you have the friends that you, you, you keep at this length, you know, arm's length. And they're, they're friends, they're acquaintances, and you share some stuff with them. But then you have the friends that you go up and you give a hug to. And, and when they say how things going, you don't say, oh, it's all fine. You say, well, I'm, I'm, this is really bugging me today. This is hurting. You know, this happened. You know, what kind of friend do you want God to be? Is he somebody you're going to keep at arm length? Or are you going to share the real things? It's really a question of, it's a question of how much relationship you're willing to have more than how much relationship you can have. Because you can have as much of a relationship with God and the Holy Spirit as you want. Hmm? Um, let's say, let's read a couple, and, and I'm not sure where the Holy Spirit's going on this. We'll see. But uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 8 through 14, it is written, No eye is seen, nor ear is heard, nor the heart of man imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. Okay? So those who love him. In other words, he loves us all. But those who love him, those who, who and I, in the picture I could see today, I saw him hugging people, and some people hugged back, and some people sat there. And they got the hug, and they felt the love for that moment. But it's a little different if you hug somebody. You're not letting go. You're holding on. You know, if I, if I hug my son, he's stuck with me as long as I hug on him and don't let go, right? Some of you, when the Lord goes to hug you, I can see it almost makes you uncomfortable. Because maybe you don't feel like you're worthy of that love. Or maybe you feel like something, somehow you have to protect yourself because maybe he'll disappoint you. But that's, that's not going to happen. His love's perfect. You know? No. For the, what God has prepared for those who love Him. These things God has revealed to us through His Spirit, through the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except for the Spirit of that person which is in Him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except for the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. Lord, help us to understand the things you have truly given us, that you have unfolded before us. May we truly taste those things, not know about them, not think we know about them, not even understand them to a degree, but may we experience them. May we live in them. May we live life in such a way with you that we really receive them. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. But they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. So there's a picture of a, of a paradigm change there. There's a picture of what the people of God are called to be. We're called to be those who receive from the Spirit of God, not the Spirit of this world, which is fear, which is anxiety which is anger and strife, but the Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, which wants to reveal truth to us, wants to bring us peace and rest, wants to show us the goodness of God revealed in our own lives. You know, the same thing could happen to two different people, and one person will praise God because God did this, and another person will say, oh, well, almost, you know, it's all in how we interpret it. In other words, what is our paradigm? Are we seeing the hand of God moving in our life? Because the hand of God is moving in each of our lives. He is making a way for us. He is our way maker. He is our wall taker. He is our chain breaker. He's the healer of our eyes and the toucher of our hearts. He's the one who sets us free. Amen. 
But it's in how we receive that. It's in allowing our paradigm, how we view the world, how we understand things to be changed. That's what takes us from being inactive and not having the desire, the want to move to all of a sudden there's such excitement that it literally isn't moving so much as in a chore, but it's skipping to the next destination with the Lord. Can you imagine that if you know, you know, you know that He's making a way, you're literally shaking and just ready to go. It's like the kid in the car trip. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are you asking God, are we there yet? Because He's wanting to take you there. He's, wanting, he's waiting on you. You're not waiting on Him. The Israelites were not waiting on God. He was waiting on them. You know, Ryan shared this before, and I've had a picture of this when I first started coming to Antioch, actually. He says Antioch's called to be a train station, a train station where people come in, they drop off baggage, they drop things off, they change trains, which change directions, and then they get food, rest, and healing, and then they move on to the next thing God has for them. To me, that train station is a place where your paradigm, for the $5 word, but your mindset, how you view yourself, how you view God, how you feel, view God feels about you, that changes so that you can be positioned in such a way that the things that would have weighed you down, the baggage that you brought in, you never, no longer carry it. It's not yours. Shame is not your baggage. That's not something for you to carry and take through life. Oh yeah, this is my little bag of shame from the past 25 years ago. Oh, this is my fears, worries, and anxieties about this. And I, I, I'm going to carry that through life. He says his burden is easy and his yoke is light. And every other yoke, he's going to break off of you. Okay? All those things are broken off. He has died for you. You are set free. He is your deliverer. But if you choose to bring your baggage along, did he do it? Who did it? In other words, we're choosing what yokes we walk with, what baggage we carry. Amen. This is the train station. This is your moment today. Yep. Okay? Let's, let's stand up. Janet, can you... <sighs> The Lord has not given us a spirit of fear, but of sound mind and overcoming, right? He has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Everything that pertains to life and walking in His purposes and plans, His truth, His freedom. He's not given us shame. He's not given us fear, worry, and anxiety. He's not given us sickness. He's not handed those things to us. Those are things that we're bringing along. And today's the day that we can leave those things up here. We can leave behind the things of the past. We can leave behind the hurts. The rooms in our house, the portions of our picture that we haven't want to look at, He wants to go into those rooms. He wants to go to that portion of the picture and He wants to show you that even in the midst of that, He was there and He was painting that picture with you. Even in the midst of that bright red, he was still there. He's still covering that. He's taking care of it. It's terrible when you can't get to that last page of your notes and you can't remember if you forgot to say something that he said you specifically had to say. But this morning, I know what he wants to say is that he loves you 
and that he he wants to help rewrite how you see the world he wants to rewrite your software he wants you to be Kelly 2.0 he wants you to be more than he hasn't created you to be less than and the more than comes by seeing as he sees by allowing him to open your eyes and give you a fresh set of eyes by allowing him to love on you and to change how you hear when he says i love you there's no but when he says i love you there's no if you will he's saying i love you i love you in spite of anything else i will love you through all eternity i will love you Today, receive that. Today, don't put your own translation, your own extra words on the back end of that. Today, know that his plan and his purposes for you are perfect. Yes, he has a plan to bless you, to prosper you to bring you into a wide open place to bring you into a place of freedom to bring you into a place of his presence a place of awareness a place of vision a place of cultivation a place where he will prosper you in the spirit So Holy Spirit, this morning, I ask that you would open our eyes. Give us eyes to see the painting you're painting in our life. Give us revelation of who you are. Let us taste and see. Let us receive your love. Let it wash away the shame. Let it wash away. Let it wash away the hearts. Let it wash away the eye butts. But I can't. But I shouldn't. But I don't want to. Wash away. We are your new creation. Created for such a glorious purpose, a creation in whom you are well pleased. Lisa, in who you are well pleased. Christine, in who you are well pleased. Michael, in who you are well pleased. I hear that. I hear that. I hear that. I hear the words. I hear his spirit saying. I'm well pleased in you. I'm well pleased in you. You are a fearfully and wonderfully beautifully made in my image. I'm well pleased. I love you. The butts don't scare me. The doors that are closed don't scare me. Jake, I love you. I love you. I love you. Taste and see. Canto shiato do leanto do basunto. No bacu shiato do basiato do basuto rianto. Amaco do riato do riato do riato do riato Lord, we repent of allowing our experience, the world, our past, our thoughts to frame the truth. Lord, we receive your truth unframed, unbound, 
unlimited. Show us the truth. Show us who you've made us to be and show us who you are.